The Art of Living Consciously The Power of Awareness to Transform Everyday Life By Nathaniel Brandon Part 3 The truth is that all aspects of our being are integral, important, and valuable parts of us. The more we distrust and suppress these energies, the more likely they are to eventually burst out in distorted ways. In other words, our problems are not necessarily caused by our emotional, non-rational nature running wild and uncontrolled, instead, both personal and social problems are more likely to be the result of fear and the suppression of our emotions, instinctual nature, and intuition. In this book, we are focusing on how we can reclaim the power of our intuitive sense. Once we accept the reality of a higher power that is channeled to us through our intuition, it becomes clear that many of our personal problems and the ills of the world are actually caused by not following our intuition. Our rational mind is like a computer, it processes the input it receives and calculates logical conclusions based on this information. The rational mind is finite, it can only compute the input it has received directly. In other words, our rational minds can only operate on the basis of the direct experience each of us has had in this lifetime. The intuitive mind, on the other hand, seems to have access to an infinite supply of information. It appears to be able to tap into a deep storehouse of knowledge and wisdom, the universal mind. It is also able to sort out this information and supply us with exactly what we need, when we need it. Though the message may come through a bit at a time, if we learn to follow this supply of information piece by piece, the necessary course of action will be revealed. As we learn to rely on this guidance, life takes on a flowing, effortless quality. Our life, feelings, and actions interweave harmoniously with those of others around us. It is as if each of us played a unique instrument in a huge symphony orchestra, conducted by a universal intelligence. If we play our part without regard for the conductor's direction or the rest of the orchestra, we will have total chaos. If we try to take our cues from those around us, rather than the conductor, it will be impossible to achieve harmony, there are too many people, all playing different things. Our intellect is not able to process so much input and decide on the best note to play at each moment. However, if we watch the conductor and follow his direction we can experience the joy of playing our unique part, which can be heard and appreciated by everyone, and at the same time experience ourselves as part of a greater harmonious whole. When we apply this analogy to our lives, we see that most of us have never realized a conductor was present. We have lived the best we can, using only our intellect to understand our lives, to figure out the best course of action. If we are honest with ourselves, we will readily admit that we are not making great music under the guidance of our rational mind alone. The dissonance and chaos in our lives and in the world certainly reflects the impossibility of living this way. By tuning into the intuition and allowing it to become the guiding force in our lives, we allow our inner, conductor, to take its rightful place as the leader of the orchestra. Rather than losing our individual freedom, we receive the support we need to effectively express our individuality. Moreover, we will enjoy the experience of being part of a larger creative process. I don't fully understand how the intuition functions in such an amazing way, but I definitely know, through direct experience and through observation and feedback from the many people I have worked with, that it does. And I find that the more I trust and follow this inner intuitive voice, the easier, fuller, and more exciting my life becomes. Meditation Sit or lie down in a comfortable position in a quiet place. Close your eyes and relax. Take several slow, deep breaths, relaxing your body more with each breath. Relax your mind and let your thoughts drift, but don't hold on to any thought. Imagine that your mind becomes as quiet as a peaceful lake. Now focus your conscious awareness into a deep place in your body, in the area of your stomach or solar plexus. It should be the place in your body where you feel that your gut feelings reside. This is the physical place where you can easily contact your intuition. Imagine that you have a wise being living inside there. You might have an image of what this wise being looks like, or you might just sense that it is there. 
This wise being is really a part of you, your intuitive self. You can communicate with it by silently talking to it, making requests, or asking questions. Then relax, don't think too hard with your rational mind, and be open to receiving the answers. The answers are usually very simple, they relate to the present moment, not the past or future, and they feel right. If you don't receive an immediate answer, let go and go about your life. The answer will come later, whether from inside of you in the form of a feeling or idea, or from outside through a person, a book, an event, or whatever. For example, you might say, intuition, tell me what I need to know here. What do I need to do in this situation? Trust the feeling that you get and act on it. If it is truly your intuition, you will find that it leads to a feeling of greater aliveness and power, and more opportunities begin to open up for you. If it doesn't lead to these things, you may not have been truly acting from your intuition but from some other voice in you. Go back and ask for clarification. It takes practice to hear and trust your intuition. The more you do it, the easier it will become. Eventually you will be able to contact your intuition, ask yourself questions, and know that in that wise being within you, an incredible source of power and strength is available to answer your questions and guide you. As you grow more sensitive to this guidance you will gain a sense of knowing what you need to do in any situation. Your intuitive power is always available to guide you whenever you need it. It will open to you as you become willing to trust yourself and your inner knowledge. Chapter 4 Becoming a Creative Channel To whatever degree you listen to and follow your intuition, you become a creative channel for the higher power of the universe. When you willingly follow where your creative energy leads, the higher power can come through you to manifest its creative work. When this happens, you will find yourself flowing with the energy, doing what you really want to do, and feeling the power of the universe moving through you to create or transform everything around you. In using the word channel, I am not referring to the psychic process of trance channeling. Trance channeling involves a medium who goes into a trance state and allows another being to speak through him or her. By channeling, I mean being in touch with and bringing through the wisdom and creativity of your own deepest source. Being a channel is being fully and freely yourself and consciously knowing that you are a vehicle for the creativity of the universe. Every creative genius has been a channel. Every masterwork has been created through the channeling process. Great works are not created by the personality alone. They arise from a deep inspiration on the universal level, and are then expressed and brought into form through the individual personality. A person may have great technical skill, but without the ability to connect with a deeper source, his work will be uninspiring. The difference between a technician and a channel was clearly demonstrated in the movie Amadeus. The composer Salieri knew how to write music but he didn't know how to tap into the creative source. Mozart wrote music that was both technically perfect and wonderfully inspired, and he did so easily, spontaneously, without thought or effort. From his early childhood on, music just seemed to bubble up and overflow from within him. I'm sure he had no idea how it happened and could not have explained to anyone else how to do it. Such genius has always seemed mysterious and unexplainable, a God-given talent possessed by only a few. It seems to come and go at will, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Because of this, many creative people fear their talent will suddenly disappear. They don't know how they got it so they have no idea how to recover it if it vanishes. Creative people often function as channels in only one area of their lives, such as one of the arts, science, or business, and may have no idea how to do it in other areas of their lives. Thus, their lives can be terribly out of balance. See the section on highly intuitive people in the chapter on trusting intuition. This is one reason why we often equate genius with emotional instability. I believe we are all geniuses, each in our own unique way. We will discover the nature of our particular genius when we stop trying to conform to our own or other people's models, learn to be ourselves, and allow our natural channel to open. Through trusting and acting on our intuition, 
it's possible to bring our natural creative inspiration into every moment, in every area of our lives. When I speak of a channel, I have an image of a long round pipe with energy flowing through it. It's somewhat like the pipe in a pipe organ, with the music coming through. This channel image has three important features, one, it is open and unobstructed inside so that the energy can move through freely. Two, it has a definite physical form, a structure surrounds the open space so that the energy is directed in a particular way. Without this structure, the energy would be free-floating, without any focus. 3. It has a power source, something that moves energy through the channel. In a pipe organ, the power source, the organ, sends energy through the open pipes. The particular combination of open space inside each pipe and the structure, the size and shape of the pipe, causes a certain note to be sounded. The power source is the same for all the pipes and the energy moving through them is the same, but because each one is a different shape, each one makes a unique sound. We can think of ourselves as channels similar to these pipes. We have a common power source, the universal life force, and the same creative energy flows through each of us. Our body and personality form the structure that determines the unique direction and function of each of us as a channel. It is up to us to keep our channel open and clear and to build and maintain a strong, healthy, beautiful body-slash-personality structure as a vehicle for our creative energy. We can do this by constantly tuning in, asking where the energy wants to go, and moving with it. A strong body-slash-personality structure is not created by following anybody else's rules or good ideas about what you should eat, how you should exercise, or anything else. It is created primarily by trusting your intuition and learning to follow its direction. When deciding what to eat, how to exercise, or anything else, gather information from reliable sources, then check in with yourself to see what feels intuitively right for you, and do your best to follow your own inner guidance. Most of us have had occasional experiences of trusting our intuition and having things work out in amazing ways. The following true story is a good example of this. A few years ago, my editor, Becky, had achieved what many people think of as the American dream. She had a husband and daughter, a good job, money in the bank, and owned her own home. Yet she felt an emptiness inside. She felt an inner prompting to leave her job and pursue a career in publishing. Her husband did not support this idea. In fact, he pointed out that she didn't have the formal education necessary to obtain a position in a publishing house. Becky and her husband eventually separated, and she decided to make a move. She had been reading many books, including Living in the Light, and knew that she wanted to work for a pub, Lisher in the field of personal growth. Her intuitive feeling was that she needed to move to Northern California. It was the most difficult and courageous step she had ever taken. She found herself in a new community with no friends, no job, and no money. She had no luck, at first, obtaining a publishing job, and so she looked for any kind of work that would enable her to survive. Many times she questioned her choice to take such a risk, yet she kept feeling a deep sense that she was on the right track. Finally, she found work in another field. She was able to get back on her feet financially and she regained her confidence. She continued her search for a publishing job, and this time she was successful. She happily took a cut in pay and position to take an entry-level job at New World Library, the company she had always hoped to work for. Finally, she felt, she was at home. As of this writing, Becky has been with New World Library for six years. She has her dream job as the editorial director. By following her inner guidance, even through very difficult times, she found the perfect place to express her creativity and make her contribution to the world. You may have had a similar experience, where listening to your intuition about something proved so fruitful and fulfilling. If so, the next step is to become more conscious of the process so you can recognize when you are following the flow of energy, as opposed to blocking, fighting, or trying to control it. The more willing you are to surrender to the energy within you, 
the more power can flow through you. I know most of us have had experiences at certain times when we felt life energy, wisdom, and power flow through us, when we have felt momentarily enlightened. We have a brief moment of clarity and power and then it goes away again. When it goes away, we feel lost and unsure of ourselves. The more you practice trusting and following your intuition, the more consistently you will feel that sense of flow. At these times you may find yourself right where you want to be at every moment. You'll be where the energy is the greatest for you, doing what you want to do, and watching miracles being accomplished. Your energy may have a transformational effect on others, as well. As you strengthen the commitment to trusting yourself, everything in your life may change. At first, as you begin to let go of your old patterns, it may appear that things in your life are falling apart. You may find that you have to let go of certain things you've been attached to. Some relationships in your life may dissolve or simply fizzle out from lack of energy. Old pastimes may no longer interest you. You may even lose your job or decide to leave it. Of course, these changes can be upsetting and frightening. Over time, however, you will find that this is all part of the transformation you are going through. As you learn to be true to yourself, you will find that you attract people, work, and other circumstances that reflect your evolution and development. Maintaining your focus. In order to live fully and creatively, it's important to stay focused on following your own energy. This focus allows your channel to remain open to the energy flowing through. It's so easy to lose your focus, to get lost in other people, external goals, and desires. And the problem is, we do exactly that, we lose our connection with ourselves. As long as we are overly focused on the outside there will always be an empty, hungry, lost place inside that needs to be filled. If I'm in love with someone and begin to think of him as my source of joy, then I lose myself. I have to remind myself that the source of joy and love is already within me, that I am experiencing love externally only because it is inside me. I try to keep the focus on the universe within and at the same time feel the universe coming through my lover to me. For me, it's a constant discipline to remember to go back inside to connect with my intuition. I'll remind myself regularly during the day to do this. If I find myself getting lost in my outer activities, I'll check back inside to see if I'm being true to my feelings. This keeps the flow of the universe moving through me. As we learn to pay attention to our intuitive feelings, follow our own energy and live our truth, we find that we feel more and more of the life force moving through us. That feeling of greater aliveness is so wonderful that it becomes our major focus and source of fulfillment. We feel less attached to the externals of our lives. Whether or not things go as we have planned seems less important when we feel that our satisfaction is coming primarily from sustaining our connection to our own life energy. Ironically, when we stay true to ourselves in this way, the externals of our lives reflect our inner integrity. We attract to us and create around us exactly what our hearts and souls truly desire. Living as a channel. Channeling works in two ways, energy either flows through you to others, or from others to you. For example, as I write my book, I focus on the energy flowing from the universe through me to others. Then, when people say to me, I just love your books, they've changed my life, I am conscious of appreciation coming from them to me, and through me, back to the universal source. As you become increasingly conscious of the flow of life moving through you and through everything and everyone else, your body will become capable of channeling more energy. The more energy you are willing to receive, the more you'll be able to give. To become a clear channel for the universe presents the highest challenge and offers the greatest potential joy and fulfillment for every human being. Being a channel means living fully and passionately in the world, having deep relationships, playing, working, creating, enjoying money and material possessions, being yourself, yet maintaining your profound connection with the power of the universe within you, learning and growing from every experience that you have. Then you can watch the universe create through you, it can use you to do its work.
Living as a channel is an ongoing learning process that's available to anyone who is willing to make the inner commitment. Group Channeling As we develop the ability to trust and follow our intuition, we learn to open and strengthen our individual channel so we can bring more power, creativity, and love through us. When we come together in a relationship or in a group, each individual channel becomes part of a bigger channel. A group channel is created that is more powerful than any of us can be individually. When many bodies and minds are willing to surrender, open up, and grow, these combined energies create a very strong, open structure that allows a lot more energy to come through from the universe. The process intensifies tremendously and everyone gets a powerful boost from the energy, which is capable of pushing each of us to the next level of our growth. Even though we may all be in somewhat different places and going through different things, each person receives the inspiration, the support, the push, or whatever is needed to enable them to take the next step on their journey. A group channel can open us up to a deeper level of awareness, and in the process, we share more of ourselves and find that we are healed of things that have held us back. This is one reason I love teaching workshops and working with groups. My friends call me an energy junkie because I'm always attracted to situations where the energy is most intense and expansive. I love the way my personal growth process is accelerated by the intensification that happens in groups. I have found that in leading a group, I usually need to start with a certain amount of structure and take responsibility to clear LY maintain the leader position. As the group continues, I can let go of the structure more and more and gradually allow the spontaneous energy of the group to take over. As everyone surrenders and opens up, the group channel is formed. This process can be confusing and chaotic at times because, as the leader, I am no longer in control in the usual sense of the word. It can arouse my fears and everyone else's, but I find that when I'm willing to move through the fears, something powerful and beautiful emerges through the group channel. The universe leads us into new places and new discoveries that we would not have had an opportunity to experience if we had stayed within a more formal structure. I find the process of group channeling very exciting and rewarding. In a sense, everyone living on this planet is a part of a gigantic group channel, the mass consciousness of humanity. This world, as it is now, is the creation of the group channel. As each one of us, individually, surrenders to the power of the universe and allows that power to transform and enlighten us, the group channel is affected accordingly. The mass consciousness becomes more and more evolved. This is how I see our world being transformed. Meditation Sit or lie down in a comfortable position. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath and relax your body. Take another deep breath and relax your mind. Continue to breathe slowly and deeply and let go of all tension or anxiety. As you relax, you find yourself in a deep, quiet place inside. Allow yourself to just rest in that place for a few moments, with nothing you need to do or think about. From this deep, quiet place, begin to sense the life force within you. Imagine that you are following your own energy, feeling it, trusting it, moving with it in every moment of your life. You are being completely true to yourself, speaking and living your truth. You feel alive and empowered. Imagine that you are expressing your creativity fully and freely, and let yourself enjoy that experience. By being who you are and expressing yourself, you are having a healing and empowering effect on everyone you encounter and on the world around you. Chapter 5. Exploring Our Many Selves We are all born with an infinite number of different qualities or energies within us. One of our most important tasks in life is to discover and develop as many of these energies as possible, so that we can be well-rounded and experience the full range of our potential. We can think of these energies as different archetypes, sub-personalities, or selves within us. In a way, it's as if there are many different characters living inside of us, each with its own task and purpose. Since the physical world is a plane of duality, for each of these energies within us, there is an opposite energy. In order to experience wholeness and balance, 
we need to develop and integrate both sides of every polarity. Most of us, however, are not accustomed to thinking in this way. We have been taught to think in a linear, exclusive fashion, good slash bad, right slash wrong. So if one quality is good or desirable, its opposite is bad or undesirable. For example, many of us have been taught that it is virtuous and admirable to give to others, a person who gives a lot is a good person. Therefore, taking is thought to be selfish, a person who takes a lot for himself might be judged as less worthy than a giving person. Someone else with different values might think of this in an opposite way. He might admire a person who knows how to take a lot for himself and think of that person as smart and successful, while looking down on someone who is less aggressive and more giving as being foolish and easily taken advantage of. Either way, one polarity is honored while the opposite is devalued. In reality, both giving and receiving are equally important and valuable. If we give too much and aren't able to take or receive equally, we become depleted and resentful. If we take too much and are unable to give, we lose the satisfaction of making a country, but ion, and incur the resentment of others. If we can give and receive more or less in balance, we experience a healthy sense of satisfaction. From the time we are born, we begin to experiment with expressing the different energies within us. At that time we are completely dependent on our parents or caretakers for our survival and well-being, so we are extremely sensitive to their reactions to us. If we express an energy that invokes approval and positive attention, we are likely to continue to develop that quality. On the other hand, if something we do draws disapproval, criticism, or punishment, we are likely to discontinue it, unless that is the only form of attention we can get, in which case we may continue it. Fairly soon, we have a pretty good sense of which energies help us get our needs met and which ones seem to cause us more problems than they are worth. This varies greatly according to each individual, family system, time period, and culture. As we grow up, we continue to develop the energies that seem to work best to meet our needs. We become very identified with these qualities, that's who we think we are. These dominant energies become our primary selves, the inner characters whose job it is to take care of us and make our lives work as well as possible. There are usually a group of primary selves who work together as a team, making most of our decisions for us. For example, some of my primary selves are the super responsible one, the pleaser, who wants to make everyone happy so they will like me, the pusher, who wants me to work hard and accomplish a lot, the caretaking mother who takes care of the child and other people so that they'll feel good with me, the consciousness teacher slash healer. There are a number of others on the team as well. They have all worked very hard to make me a worthy, well-loved, and successful person. For every primary self, there is an opposite energy, which oftentimes has been repressed or denied because one way or another we got the message that it was not okay, or because it simply hasn't had space to develop. These energies become our disowned selves. They are usually buried within our psyche and we either don't know about them at all, or we are aware of them and try to hide them from the world. The disowned selves make up our shadow side, the parts of ourselves that we are embarrassed about, ashamed of, fearful of, or uncomfortable with. Our primary selves are usually working hard to make sure that we don't show these disowned selves to the world, since they are convinced that this would invite criticism, rejection, abandonment, or some form of disaster. The problem is that each of these disowned selves carries an essential energy that is an important part of us. In fact, we are often in desperate need of these qualities in order to bring healing and balance into our lives. As long as we fear our shadow side, however, we can't access the energies that we need. For example, if one of your primary selves is power, and you are very identified with being strong, competent, and independent, it is very likely that you have disowned your vulnerable side, the part of you that feels dependent on others and has needs for love and support. From the point of view of your power primary self, your vulnerable side might seem disgusting and way too dangerous to show to the world for fear of being hurt. You might be completely unconscious of having a vulnerable side, 
or you might be aware of it but not want others to see it for fear of their judgment. Strangely, you will find that you are constantly attracting vulnerable people into your life, and you may at times feel very judgmental toward them for being so weak. Believe it or not, you need to consciously accept and own your vulnerable side. Without it, you cannot have real intimacy and closeness with others, and you can't really receive. You are out of touch with a very important part of your human experience. Life has an amazing way of confronting us with, and reflecting to us, the exact energies that we need to discover within ourselves and integrate into our lives. This happens through our dreams, where we are often shown symbolically the relationships between our primary selves and disowned selves. It happens constantly in our relationships, where others reflect to us the various different selves within us. Our imbalances show up in every area of our lives from our health to our finances. How do we become conscious of the many selves within and bring them into balance in our lives? The first and most important step is to begin to recognize and become aware of our primary selves. What qualities and energies are you most identified with? Can you begin to notice the selves within you that automatically make most of your decisions and run your life? We want to honor and appreciate our primary selves for how much they've done for us, while separating a bit from being totally identified with them. As soon as we become conscious of them as energies within us rather than who we are, we are beginning to develop what is called, aware ego. Aware ego is the ability to recognize and hold all the different selves within us, so that we can have conscious choice about which ones we bring through at any given moment. Once we have some awareness in relation to our primary selves, the disowned selves start to come forth. The primary selves usually remain our strongest qualities, but we begin to feel more balanced and our lives begin to work better as we begin to integrate the energy from previously disowned selves. The disidentification with the primary selves, the development of aware ego, and the acknowledging of the disowned selves is a gradual process that happens over a lifetime. Every step we take in this process, however, can make a big difference in our lives. Our intuitive wisdom is one of the energies or selves within us. If we were encouraged to trust our intuition at an early age, or had an intuitive parent figure as an early role model, our intuition may be a primary self. Since our culture tends to deny or devalue the intuitive function, however, for most of us it is a disowned or relatively underdeveloped self, while rationality is usually one of the primary selves. If ra rationality is a primary self, and intuition is disowned, in order to get in touch with our inner guidance, we may need to separate from over-identification with our rational side. We do this by recognizing it as one aspect of who we are, and beginning to notice how it operates in our lives. Once we become more aware of it in this way, we are no longer so identified with it and we can begin to have more conscious choice about how and when we use it. This creates space to explore our intuitive side as well. If intuition is a primary self, we may have difficulty thinking logically or dealing with practical matters in a grounded way. In this case, we may need to develop our rational, practical side in order to ground our intuition in the physical world. Owning our shadow side. There is a simple universal principle, everything in the universe wants to be accepted. All aspects of creation want to be loved, appreciated, and included. So, any quality or energy that you are not allowing yourself to experience or express will keep coming up inside of you or around you until you recognize it as a part of you, until you accept it and integrate it into your personality and your life. Many people who are involved in personal growth become very identified with the energies and qualities that they think of as being, spiritual, peaceful, loving, giving, and so on. In attempting to develop these aspects of themselves, they often deny and disown other aspects that they consider to be unspiritual, aggression, assertiveness, gut-level honesty, human vulnerability. Unfortunately, this simply creates a huge shadow side within them, which contributes to the collective shadow of denied energies in our world. For some, it can be quite shocking to realize that if we over-identify with peace and love, 
and disown our inner warrior, we are not contributing to world peace. Quite the opposite, in fact. If we don't own our inner warrior and channel him in a constructive way in our lives, he retreats into the shadows of our individual and collective psyche, and actually contributes to the perpetuation of war on our planet. If we truly want inner peace and world peace, we must do the difficult but fascinating work of owning and appreciating all aspects of who we are, truly making peace with ourselves. Real consciousness involves holding both sides of any polarity, not identifying with one. Exploring and embracing our darkness is the only way we can truly live in the light. Meditation Get in a comfortable position in a quiet place. Bring to mind one of your main personality characteristics or primary selves. Get a sense in your body of how that energy feels. Now imagine an opposite energy, which may be disowned or less developed in you. Imagine what that energy would feel like. What would be the positive benefits of developing more ability to contact that energy? How could that bring more balance into your life? See if you can feel a balance of both of those energies at the same time. For example, if you are an outgoing person, you might balance that with a quieter, more introspective energy. If you are hardworking, you might balance that with the energy of relaxation or playfulness. Chapter 6 The World as Our Mirror the physical world is our creation, we each create our own version of the world, our particular reality, our unique life experience. Because I am creating my life, I can look at my creation to get feed back about myself. Just as an artist looks at his latest creation to see what works well and what doesn't, and thereby improves his skills, we can look at the ongoing masterwork of our lives to appreciate who we are and to recognize what we still need to learn. We're creating our lives as we go along, therefore, our experiences give us an instant, ongoing reflection of ourselves. In fact, the external world is like a giant mirror that reflects our consciousness clearly and accurately. Once we have learned how to look into that mirror and perceive and interpret its reflection, we have a fabulous tool for self-awareness. Understanding that the world is our mirror can help us see our lives as a reflection of our beliefs, attitudes, and emotional patterns. Viewed in this way, the external world can teach us about hidden aspects of ourselves that we can't see directly. The process is based on two premises, one, I assume that everything in my life is my reflection, my creation, there are no accidents or events that are unrelated to me. If I see or feel something, if it has any impact on me, then my soul has attracted or created it to show me something. If it didn't mirror some part of myself, I wouldn't even be able to see it. All the people in my life are reflections of the various characters and energies that live inside of me. 2. I always try to avoid putting myself down for the reflections I see. I know that nothing is negative. Everything is a gift that brings me to self-awareness, after all, I'm here to learn. If I was already perfect I wouldn't be here. Why should I get angry at myself when I see things I've been unconscious of? It would be like a first grader getting frustrated because she wasn't in college yet. I try to maintain a compassionate attitude toward myself and my learning process. To the extent that I can do this, the learning process becomes fun and really quite interesting. I am learning to view my life as a fascinating and adventurous movie. All the characters in it are parts of me played out on the big screen so that I can clearly see them. Once I see them and recognize their various feelings and voices inside myself, I can understand that they are all important and valuable parts of me that I need for my full expression in this life. If the movie portrays problems, hassles, or struggles, I know I must check inside to find out where I'm not being true to myself or have more learning and healing to do. I also know that when I'm trusting and being myself as fully as possible, everything in my life reflects this by falling into place easily and working smoothly. Problems are messages. If there are problems in your life, the universe is trying to get your attention. It's saying, hey, there's something you need to be aware of, something that needs to be changed here. If you pay attention to the small signals, you will learn from them, 
but if you don't, the problems will intensify until you get the message and start to pay attention. If you accept that every time a problem occurs the universe is showing you something, you will make rapid progress on your journey of self-discovery. When something negative happens, it's tempting to say, why does this happen to me? I'm doing the best I can but nothing seems to be going right. I can't understand why I keep having this problem. If you find yourself doing this, try to open up to another way of looking at things. Go inside and say to the universe, I know you're trying to show me something. Help me understand what it is. After you do this, let go of focusing on it, and go about your life, but stay open to the message that will be coming through. It may come in the form of an inner feeling or awareness, some words from a friend, or something unexpected that happens to you. The message may come through immediately or it may take quite a while. One of my clients was fired, quite unexpectedly, over two years ago. At first, he was devastated, but after a few months of getting his bearings, he went into business on his own. His business is now doing very well, but it was only a few weeks ago that he understood the message that his firing reflected. As he was talking to a friend about working for other people, he suddenly realized that the firing incident was trying to tell him that he was ready to be in business for himself, rather than working for other people. For him, this realization not only affirmed his present course in life, but it also finally resolved the sense of failure about being fired that had lingered with him since the incident. Interpreting the Reflection The trickiest part of using the mirror process is learning how to interpret the reflection you see. Once you do get a message, but you're not quite sure what it is, how do you find out? It will not help to overanalyze or obsess about it with your rational mind. It is far more effective to turn to your intuitive self, to ask the universe for help. Simply sit quietly, take a few deep breaths, and focus your awareness within, to the wise part of you that is in touch with the wisdom of the universe. Ask this part, either silently or out loud, for guidance or help in understanding the message. As you tune into your gut feelings and get a sense of what feels right in the moment, act on this feeling. After acting on the feeling, try to be aware of the external and internal feedback from your actions. The external feedback is how well things work. Do things seem to fall into place and work easily? Then you're surely in tune with your inner guidance. If you're struggling to do something that doesn't happen easily, it's a message to let go and check back in to find out what you really want to be doing. Internal feedback will come to you as feelings. If you feel empowered, more alive, then it's right. The ultimate key is aliveness. The more the universe moves through you, the more alive you feel. Conversely, every time you don't follow your inner guidance you feel a loss of energy, loss of power, a sense of spiritual or emotional deadness. In being true to yourself you will feel more alive, but you may also feel uncomfortable. This is because you are risking change. As you undergo certain changes, you may experience various intense emotions such as fear, grief, or anger. Allow these emotions expression, after all, your inner guidance has to move through years of accumulated unconsciousness, denial, doubt, and fear. So let your feelings come up and wash through you, you are being cleaned out and healed. At times like this, it is very important to have emotional support and a safe place to explore your feelings and do your healing process. If possible, I recommend finding a good therapist or support group, an environment where you are encouraged and supported in experiencing your own feelings and needs, expressing yourself honestly, and trusting your own sense of what's right for you. When you are growing and changing rapidly, your inner doubts and fears will often be reflected in the reactions of those around you. If your friends and family question or judge the changes in you, recognize that they are simply mirroring the doubting, fearful voices in you, such as, what if I'm doing the wrong thing? Can I really trust this process? Respond to such feedback from others in whatever way you feel is appropriate, reassure them, ignore them, argue with them, whatever. 
The important thing is to recognize that you are really dealing with your own inner fears. The conflicts you may experience with others are mirroring the conflicts within yourself, between the parts of you that want to grow and change, and those that feel safer to do things the way you've always done them. Affirm that you are learning to trust yourself more and more. You will be amazed to see how frequently others will begin to mirror your increasing self-trust and confidence by responding to you with trust and confidence. Here are some ways that the mirror of life reflects us, if you judge and criticize yourself, others will judge and criticize you. If you hurt yourself, others will hurt you. If you lie to yourself, others will lie to you. If you are irresponsible to yourself, others will be irresponsible in relation to you. If you blame yourself, others will blame you. If you do violence to yourself emotionally, others will do violence to you emotionally, or even physically. If you don't listen to your feelings, no one will listen to your feelings. If you love yourself, others will love you. If you respect yourself, others will respect you. If you trust yourself, others will trust you. If you are honest with yourself, others will be honest with you. If you are gentle and compassionate with yourself, others will treat you with compassion. If you appreciate yourself, others will appreciate you. If you honor yourself, others will honor you. If you enjoy yourself, others will enjoy you. Changing old patterns. It's very important to realize that you may not be able to change your old patterns overnight. Sometimes things seem to change rapidly, once you've recognized the message, but sometimes it seems like you keep doing the same thing and getting the same unpleasant results long after you feel you know better. It takes time for the personality to change its habits, so you may have to watch the same old movie repeat itself a few more times. If you feel your progress is too slow, ask the universe for help, and reach out for human help as well, by finding a therapist or support group. Change happens not by trying to make yourself change but by becoming conscious of what's not working. You can then ask your higher self for help in releasing the old and bringing in the new pattern. Remember, the darkest hour is just before the dawn, change often occurs just when you've given up, or when you least expect it. Using the mirror process In using the world as your mirror, you must deal with the external realities of your life in whatever way you need to handle them. But as soon as possible, before, during, or after you deal with the externals, check inside to find out what is being shown to you. For example, if someone is angry at you and blames or criticizes you, you may need to say to them, stop blaming me. I don't want to hear your judgments and criticisms of me. If you can talk about your own feelings, I'll be glad to listen, but if you keep attacking me, I'm going to leave. If they take more responsibility for their feelings, for example, I felt hurt and angry when you didn't call me yesterday, then you will probably be able to continue the conversation on a more productive level. If they continue to blame you and focus on your faults, you may need to support yourself by walking out of the room and refusing to continue the conversation until they stop their attack. Either way, you have handled the external situation. Now, as soon as you get a chance, check inside yourself and ask, I wonder what this person's anger is mirroring in me? You may realize that you have been feeling very angry and critical toward yourself lately. Or perhaps you will discover that a part of you is upset because you haven't been paying enough attention to yourself. When other people want more from you, it's usually an indication that you want more from yourself. It may in fact be a signal that it's time to show up and be more present with your own needs and feelings. Interestingly, other people in our lives often start feeling better when we become more present with ourselves. A friend of mine discovered that her boyfriend had been seeing another woman and lying to her about it. She was very hurt and angry, particularly to discover the dishonesty. They had a long talk in which she was able to express her feelings to him. Then she took some time alone for a while to sort things out on her own. When she was alone, she asked herself, is there some way I'm lying to myself, some way I'm not being totally truthful and honest with myself? that would cause me to attract a dishonest man? She let go of thinking about it and went to work. 
By the end of the day she realized she had often felt this man was not fully present with her, was not being real with her. But in the past, she had denied and covered up these feelings because she was afraid to confront him with what she felt and intuitively knew. Thus, she effectively lied to herself and supported him in his deceptions as well. She realized this was a lesson in learning to trust her feelings more and to have the courage to express and support them. She started to do this more with her boyfriend, and they eventually worked out a more honest, communicative relationship. She might also have chosen not to continue the relationship. What matters is that she received the gift from it, learning to trust and express her feelings. If you are emotionally triggered by something a person does, the two of you are probably mirrors for each other. It may appear that you have opposing viewpoints, but internally you are probably similar. One of you is acting out one side of the internal conflict, while the other plays out the other side. For example, one person may want more commitment in a relationship, while the other wants more freedom. They become extremely polarized on this issue and truly believe they want opposite things. However, if one person suddenly switches her position, the one who wanted commitment suddenly wants freedom, the other person often swings to the opposite polarity. The reason for this is that they are attempting to resolve an inner conflict they both have, the desire for closeness and security and the need for independence and autonomy, which may feel like the fear of loneliness versus the fear of entrapment. Once people look inside and become more aware of their feelings, they often recognize that they have simply projected their inner conflict onto the outside world so that they could recognize and deal with it. If a person truly and unequivocally wants a committed relationship, he will simply attract another person who wants the same thing. If someone feels completely clear about wanting to explore being with many partners, he simply does it. By using the mirror process, you can recognize what you really feel and learn to be more honest with yourself. Once you recognize an internal conflict, you can acknowledge that both polarities are really within you and find ways to honor both of the energies. For example, we all contain the polarities of desiring closeness in relationships while also desiring independence and autonomy. As conscious beings, we must learn to satisfy both these needs. By honoring both of these energies within us, we can learn to create relationships in which we have both closeness and independence. Seeing the world as your mirror also gives you wonderful opportunities to receive positive feedback. Think of everything that you like and enjoy about your life right now. You created these things, they are also your mirrors. Think of the people you know whom you love, enjoy, respect, and admire. They are your mirrors. They couldn't even be in your life if they didn't reflect you, you would not be able to recognize their positive qualities if you didn't have similar ones. Think of the people and animals that love you. They are a mirror of how you love yourself. If you have a home that you love, or a particular spot in nature that is very beautiful to you, it is a mirror of your own beauty. When you see beauty anywhere, it's a reflection of yourself. There are mirrors everywhere. Whoever you have a connection with is a mirror for you, and the deeper the connection, the stronger the mirror. Part of the fascination in using the mirror process is discovering who we are through these external reflections. The key is to always go back inside to discover the meaning of the reflection for you. The more you are willing to do that without either rationalizing away what you see or blaming yourself for it, the faster you can develop and express the multifaceted potential within you. Meditation Relax and close your eyes. Take a few deep, slow breaths and move into a deep place inside of you. Bring to your mind an important person or thing in your life and ask him, her slash it what it is mirroring to you. Stay open to receiving the answer, whether it comes in words, feelings, or images. It may come immediately or some time later. Exercises 1. Think of a person you especially love and admire. List all their positive qualities. Think about how those qualities mirror you. In some cases, they may be qualities you have not fully developed in yourself. 
recognize that this person is here to teach and inspire you by his or her example. 2. Make a list of the things and people in your life that you especially like. Praise and appreciate yourself for creating and attracting these mirrors. 3. Think of someone whom you judge or feel uncomfortable with. Try to figure out exactly what quality they have that you dislike. Is it possible that this is a quality within yourself that you deny or judge, and that your life could be enhanced if you made peace with, and were able to express, that part of yourself? For example, if you dislike someone who appears very selfish, they may be reflecting the disowned part of you that wants you to pay more attention to taking care of your own needs. Perhaps you are overly identified with taking care of others. Chapter 7 Spirit and Form Spirit is the essence of life, the energy of the universe that creates all things. Each one of us is a part of that spirit, a divine entity. So the spirit is the higher self, the eternal being that lives within us. Form is the physical world. As an individual, my form is my physical body in my personality, which includes my mind and my emotions. It is also my self-concept, my ego-slash-identity structure, my name is Shakti Gawain. I was born on September 30, 1948. I'm 5 feet 9 inches tall. I'm intelligent and have a generally outgoing personality. This is all information about my form. We, as spiritual beings, created the physical world as a place to learn. It's our school, our playground, our artist's studio. I believe that we're here to master the process of creation and to learn how to integrate all levels of our being, spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical, so that we can live in the physical world in balance and wholeness. Physicists are now discovering what metaphysicians have claimed for thousands of years, seemingly solid physical matter is, in reality, made of energy. If we look through a powerful microscope at anything, solid, we see an infinite number of little vibrating particles. If we closely examine one of these particles, we discover that it is made of even smaller particles, and so on. The fact is that everything physical is made of energy, which we can also call life force, or, spirit. So modern science supports the ancient metaphysical truth that form is created out of spirit. When our spirit decides to manifest as physical form, the first thing it creates is a physical body in which to house itself. We choose a life situation and create a body in accordance with what we feel will best serve and teach us in this lifetime. Ultimately, our goal is to create a body-slash-personality that can fully express our divine creative spirit, a form that can do everything our spirit wants to do easily, skillfully, and beautifully. However, our physical form, body-slash-personality, has an important job of its own to do. Its main responsibility is to make sure that we survive physically, and once that is assured, that we actually thrive physically and emotionally in this life. So our forms have a certain consciousness that revolves around making sure we get enough food and shelter, protecting ourselves from danger, gaining a sense of security by making sure reproduction takes place and offspring survive, creating family and community in which we can give and receive the emotional nurturing we need, and finding a sense of belonging. The energy of our spirit is very different from that of our form. Our spirit has a very expanded vision and perspective, but very little understanding of what it means to be in a human form. Our form carries our human experience, with all its limitations and vulnerabilities, and also with the knowledge of how to live in the physical world. After we are born into the body, most of us forget who we are on the spiritual level and why we came here. We take on the survival consciousness of the physical world and we get lost in the world of form. We forget that we are souls, believing we are just our personalities. We lose touch with our source of power and feel lost and helpless. Life becomes a tremendous struggle to find meaning and satisfaction. We may spend many lifetimes caught up in this cycle. Certainly, most of us have spent many years in this lifetime looking outside ourselves, trying to find fulfillment in the world of form. Eventually we realize that it's not working, no matter what we do in the world, 
we don't find profound happiness. We become unwilling to spend one more lifetime, one more year, or even one more minute in futile struggle. In frustration and hopelessness, we give up. This is usually a painful and frightening place in a person's life, it feels like hitting bottom. It is a kind of death of our old identity when the form recognizes the hopelessness of trying to live this way and surrenders its fight. It would rather die than keep trying. At this time a person often has thoughts and feelings of death, or may experience the death of a close friend or family member, or several of them. Some people create a serious illness, accident, or other major crisis at this time, and some contemplate or even attempt suicide. But the darkest hour is truly just before the dawn. When we finally give up the struggle to find fulfillment out there, we have nowhere to go but within. It is at this moment of total surrender that a new light begins to dawn. When we give up our old way of doing things, we create space for a new energy to come through. This is like being reborn. We are infants in this new world and have no idea how to live since none of our old ways work here. We feel uncertain and out of control. Yet hope is reborn in us, and a new power and vision start to come through. This can be the beginning of developing a form that is conscious of, and integrated with, our spirit. Ram Das has a beautiful analogy for this process. He likens it to a clock, where 12 o'clock is the starting point. From 12 to 3 o'clock life is totally lost in the world of form. From 3 to 6 o'clock is gradual disillusionment with the world, and 6 o'clock is where you hit bottom. You feel that you lose everything, but as you pass through 6 o'clock you are actually waking up to reconnecting with spirit. From 6 o'clock back up to 12 o'clock is ever-increasing integration of spirit and form. As individuals, we are at various stages in this process. I have a sense that we each have one major cycle of this type lasting over many physical lifetimes, and we also have an infinite number of minor cycles, sometimes almost daily. When we, as individuals, first rediscover our spirit, we are usually drawn to nurture and cultivate this awareness. This often involves withdrawing from the world to one degree or another, and going within. For some people this takes the form of spending time in nature, for some it involves practicing meditation, going to retreats, and so forth, for some it may be simply finding time to be alone and quiet. Often it's a time of partial or complete withdrawal from relationships, work, and or other attachments that tend to pull us outside of ourselves. For some, this phase may last only a few weeks or months. Each of us is unique, so we all experience this shift within in different ways. In one way or another, we learn to go inside and be in that quieter place in ourselves for a while. There we find a deeper and deeper connection with our spirit. While we are deeply connected with ourselves in this way, we often find that we have a feeling of clarity, vision, wisdom, power, and love. This is because in that moment, we are connected with the expansive energy of spirit, and not distracted by the problems and responsibilities of dealing with the world of form. If we choose to follow one of the traditional spiritual paths we may remain more or less withdrawn from the world. In this way we can be true to our spirit and avoid dealing with the attachments and patterns of our form. Unfortunately, we never have the opportunity to fully integrate spirit and form. In order to create the new world, we are being challenged to move out into the world of form with full spiritual awareness. We need to recognize the differences between our spirit and our form and learn to integrate them. Integrating spirit and form The first step in the process of consciously integrating form and spirit is to be able to recognize and feel both the consciousness of your spirit and the consciousness of your form. You may be accustomed to feeling only one of them most of the time, with occasional flashes of the other. Or you may flip back and forth frequently between the two perspectives. It's as if one takes control of the body for a while and you see things from that viewpoint. Then the other one takes over and suddenly everything looks quite different. This understanding can explain a lot of things that many of us are experiencing in our lives. 
Why is it that we have wonderful moments of consciousness and clarity, and then find we have completely lost our perspective and become immersed in fear and pain again? How is it that we can feel so loving, wise, and accepting one day and the next day feel so angry, foolish, and judgmental? Why did we feel like we'd really gotten it at a workshop and then seem to lose it the next day? How is it that we can feel so peaceful and unattached when we are meditating, yet often our relationships seem like a worse mess than ever? And how come we have such trust in the abundance of the universe but we're still having financial problems? The answer is simple, we are dealing with the discrepancies between spirit and form. This is a very difficult thing to confront, and we are facing a real challenge. Many people reach this point and have a hard time going any further. For example, I frequently get inspiring, creative ideas for a new project I want to do. I get a very strong vision of how wonderful it will be and how it can work. All this is coming from my spirit, of course. I get very excited and jump into the project, making all kinds of plans and initiating many actions in that direction. A few days or weeks later I find myself feeling totally overwhelmed, overworked, frustrated, and ready to throw the whole thing out the window. My spirit had a true vision, but I was trying to achieve it without regard to the needs of my human form. At this point I have to stop and consider what's realistic for me, then set the project aside for a while, or allow it to take longer and develop more slowly. My spirit tends to race ahead, so it has to learn to go at the pace my form can handle. The second step is to love and accept both aspects of yourself. They are both beautiful and vital parts of you. Without your spirit you wouldn't be alive, you'd only be a dead body. Without your form you wouldn't be able to be in this world, you'd be existing in some other realm of consciousness. It may be frustrating at times to see that your form can't live up to all the ideals that your spirit may have. It's important to recognize that our form has its own wisdom and the spirit can learn from the form just as the reverse is true. After all, we chose to come to this plane of existence in order to experience being human. For example, many years ago I was living with a man and we had an open relationship, in other words, we were free to be with other lovers. I had a strong spiritual ideal that I could love someone deeply and allow him to be free to follow energy he might feel with someone else, while I was free to do likewise. Sometimes I was able to do this, briefly, and I had some beautiful moments where I felt an expansive and exhilarating unconditional love. But most of the time I was overwhelmed with jealousy and emotional pain. I finally realized that my spiritual ideal simply did not fit the reality of my human feelings and needs. It became very clear to me that I could only experience the kind of emotional intimacy that I wanted in a monogamous relationship. One important key to integrating spirit and form is learning to listen to your intuition and act on it. Your inner guidance will always move you in the direction of greater balance and integration between form and spirit. Even in the process of learning to trust your inner guidance, however, you can't move faster than your form is ready to go. Here is a very important point, you cannot force your form to trust and follow intuition through will. You must allow it to educate itself through conscious observation. In other words, you can't force yourself to always follow your intuitive feelings, even though you desire to live that way. Sometimes it may seem like too big a risk, even though your spirit knows it would work out, your form is too afraid to do it. Don't push yourself past what you are ready to do. Simply observe the process and be honest with yourself about how it feels and what happens. Then, the change will happen naturally and spontaneously. For example, suppose you are with a friend and there's something you want to say but you are afraid to do so for fear your friend will get hurt or angry and reject you. If you find you do have the courage, go ahead and say what you feel. Then, observe what happens and how you feel as a result. Chances are good that you will feel energized and empowered by the experience. If, on the other hand, you are too afraid to speak the truth, don't try to push yourself past your fear. Again, simply observe yourself being with your friend and not being totally yourself. 
Notice that you feel deadness and loss of energy, you may also feel resentful toward your friend. Try not to judge yourself for your lack of action. Remember, this is a learning process. The spirit usually tends toward expansiveness, risk-taking, and change. The form often tends toward what it perceives to be safety, security, and the status quo, because its basic task is to make sure we survive and it fears that change might mean disaster or death. If you are able to observe yourself without rationalization or judgment, you will begin to notice that when you trust yourself and follow your energy fully, you feel better. Conversely, when you are controlled by old patterns of fear and holding back, you feel worse. After a while, your form gets the message clearly and begins to spontaneously follow the energy instead of the old pattern because it knows it will feel better. Eventually you have a form that automatically goes for the most alive energy in every situation, without having to think about it and control it. In this process of learning to trust yourself, many old feelings and deep emotional patterns will come to the surface to be healed and released. This is a very important part of it, and must be allowed to happen. Old memories and experiences may be triggered. Feelings of sadness, fear, pain, guilt, and rage may come up. Allow yourself to feel all of it, allow it to wash through you, it will be released. It is being cleared out of your form. As the light of spirit penetrates every cell of your body, it dispels the darkness. As you learn to consciously observe the transformation process, you will watch yourself repeating a lot of old patterns long after you seemingly know better. Spiritually and intellectually, you realize there is another way, but emotionally, you are still clinging to the old habits. This is a difficult time. Try to be patient and compassionate with yourself. When you recognize the futility of an old pattern so clearly, it's about to change. A short time later, you will suddenly begin to respond differently, in a more positive way. As you do the work of integrating spirit and form you may see your physical body change and become lighter, stronger, more clearly defined, healthier, and more beautiful. Because your life is your creation and the mirror of your transformation, all the forms in your life, your work, money, car, house, relationships, community, the world, will increasingly express the power and beauty of your spirit. Meditation. Get comfortable, relax, and close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths and relax your body and mind completely. Allow your conscious awareness to move into a deep, quiet place within you. Imagine that there is a beautiful golden light radiating from a place deep within you. It begins to grow and expand until it fills your entire body. It's very powerful, and as it fills you, it penetrates into every cell of your body, literally waking up each molecule to the light. Imagine your entire body glowing and radiating with this light. Then, see and feel your body being transformed, becoming healthier, stronger, and more beautiful. Imagine everything else in your life being similarly transformed. Exercise. See if you can observe yourself non-judgmentally and notice when you are able to listen to your intuitive feelings and act on them, and when you are not. Observe how you feel and what hap pens in each of these situations. Ask your higher power to help you learn to trust and follow your energy more and more. Chapter 8. The Male and Female Within. Each of us has male and female energies within us. I believe that one of the most important challenges we have in this world is to develop these energies fully, so they can interact in harmony with each other. The Eastern philosophies have always included the concept of yin, feminine-slash-receptive, and yang, masculine-slash-active, and have said that everything in the universe is made up of these two forces. In the West, Carl Jung did pioneering and exciting work with his concept of the anima and the animus. He explained that men have a feminine side, anima, and women have a masculine side, animus, that most of us have strongly repressed these aspects of ourselves, and that we must learn to come to terms with them. He and his followers have done wonderful work using dreams, myths, and symbols to help men and women reclaim the lost, denied parts of themselves. Many other philosophers, psychologists, poets, 
playwrights, and artists have expressed the ideas of masculine and feminine energies within ourselves and within everything. As I mentioned in the introduction, the person who helped me the most to understand the male and female within was Shirley Luthman. Her ideas in this area were so clear, simple, and profound they literally began to revolutionize my life. I found that this concept provided me with a powerful tool, I could look at just about anything in my life, or in the world, from the perspective of male-slash-female energies and understand what was really going on so much better. I began to adapt and reinterpret the ideas I'd learned from Eastern philosophy, Jung, and Luthman in my own way and incorporate them into my own metaphor. I have found that wherever I go, when I start to share this metaphor with people, they really light up. They have the same reaction I did, it makes so many things so clear. Some people have resistance to the words female and male, because in our culture we have so many preconceived ideas about what those words mean, so much emotional charge associated with them. If it's more comfortable for you, substitute the words yin and yang, active and receptive, dynamic and magnetic, or any other words that appeal to you. Male and female. I think of our female aspect as our intuitive self. This is the deepest, wisest part of ourselves. This is the feminine energy, for men or women. It is the receptive aspect, the open door through which the higher intelligence of the universe can flow, the receiving end of the channel. Our female communicates to us through our intuition, those inner promptings, gut feelings, or images that come from a deep place within us. If we don't pay conscious attention to her in our waking life, she attempts to reach us through our dreams, our emotions, and our physical body. She is the source of higher wisdom within us, and if we learn to listen carefully to her, moment by moment, she will guide us perfectly. The male aspect is action, our ability to do things in the physical world, to think, to speak, to move our bodies. Again, whether you are a man or a woman, your masculine energy is your ability to act. It is the outflowing end of the channel. The feminine receives the universal creative energy and the masculine expresses it in the world through action, thus, we have the creative process. Our female is inspired by a creative impulse and communicates it to us through a feeling, and our male acts on it by speaking, moving, or doing whatever is appropriate. For example, an artist might awaken with an inspired idea for a painting, an image communicated from his female, and immediately go into his studio, pick up his brush, and begin painting, action taken by his male. A mother might feel sudden concern for her child, a warning from her inner female, and run into the other room and pull the child away from a hot stove, action taken by her male. A business person might have an impulse to contact a certain associate, guidance from his or her female, make a call, action taken by his or her male, and put together a new deal. In each case, where the male and female within were in creative union, there was a creative result, a painting, saving the child, a business enterprise. Even the simple sequence of feeling hungry, going to the kitchen, and fixing a meal illustrates the same process. The union of feminine and masculine energies within the individual is the basis of all creation. Our female intuition plus our male action equals creativity. In order to live a harmonious and creative life, you need to have both your inner female and male energies fully developed and functioning correctly together. To fully integrate the inner male and female, you need to put the female in the guiding position. This is her natural function. She is your intuition, the door to your higher intelligence. Your male listens to her and acts on her feelings. The true function of male energy is absolute clarity, directness, and a passionate strength based on what the universe inside of you, coming through your female, tells you. The female says, I feel this. He says, I hear your feelings. What would you like me to do? She says, I want that. He says, you want that? Okay great, I'll get it for you. And he goes directly to get it for her, trusting that in her desire is the wisdom of the universe. 
Remember now that I am talking about an internal process in each of us. Sometimes people externalize this idea and think I'm saying that men should let women tell them what to do. What I'm actually saying is that we each need to let our intuition guide us, and then be willing to follow that guidance directly and fearlessly. The nature of the feminine is wisdom, love, and clear vision expressed through feeling and desire. The male nature is all-out risk-taking action in service to the feminine, much like the chivalrous knight and his lady. Through his surrender to her and his action on her behalf, our male energy builds a personality structure within us that protects and honors the sensitive energy of our intuitive female. I often imagine my male as standing behind my female, supporting, protecting, and backing her up. For a man, the image might be reversed, you might see your female as within or behind you, guiding, empowering, nurturing, and supporting you. When these two energies are thus in harmony and working together, it's an incredible feeling, a strong, open, creative channel, with power, wisdom, peace, and love flowing through. 